Uh, my name is James Fox, I'm an art historian and a fellow at Gonville and Keys College, Cambridge, and my book is called British Art in the First World War, 1914-1924. How could I resist? <laughs> In my opinion, the First World War has had a greater impact on uh, collective consciousness in Britain than almost any other event. And though now it's about 100 years old, it still feels unbelievably vivid. And you know, there are people today who, who don't know much about history, don't know much about culture, but they know a lot about the trenches. And they can even recite whole verses of war poetry. And for me, that enduring appeal of the First World War is very much down to art and culture itself. I think artists and poets and writers and composers were able to uh, transform the First World War into a kind of timeless metaphor, a metaphor for innocence lost, for youth vanquished, for an old world becoming a new world. And that's why it's such, for me, a seductive subject. Well, the First World War had a huge impact on British art, and in many different ways. Now, in the years leading up to the First World War, British, the British had really only just discovered modern art. There was a famous post-impressionist exhibition of 1910, and in 1914, the summer of 1914, Britain got its first avant-garde art movement in, the, in vorticism. Um, so modernism and modern art was just picking up a head of steam when the First World War came along, and it basically blew it all away. It destroyed vorticism, it destroyed many other progressive movements, it killed a number of progressive artists, most famously uh, the modernist sculptor Henri Gaudia Brzezka, and uh, it did a huge amount of damage elsewhere as well. But it also created opportunities, and one of the most obvious examples is the official War Artist Programme, which was a government uh, programme that hired hundreds of artists to go to the front and paint scenes of war. And that was perhaps the largest act of government patronage of art in British history. So it was very much a mixed bag. Artistic life in wartime Britain was pretty difficult. To say, to say it in short, um, because the First World War had a, had a very great impact on the, the fabric of the art world itself. So museums closed, art dealers went bankrupt, exhibition societies ceased to be able to put on exhibitions, uh, art materials like paint and brushes and canvases stopped being produced, uh, collectors stopped collecting, uh, and hundreds of artists, maybe even thousands, went to the front uh, to fight. And then to add, a, add insult to injury, if you like, the government introduced a number of policies uh, that were, made things even worse. Now, the most famous example is the Defence of the Realm Act. Now, this was a, a piece of legislation that was passed at the very beginning of the First World War. And it ultimately, among many other things, made it illegal for painters to paint, sketch or draw outdoors anywhere in the country. And my book details a number of number of accounts of artists being interrogated, arrested, even imprisoned, simply for drawing and painting outdoors. So it was a very difficult climate for artists to work in. There were so many great artists working during the First World War. I mean, the list goes on and on. John Singer Sargent, uh, William Orpen, Jacob Epstein, um, Wyndham Lewis, David Bomberg, William Roberts, Paul Nash, John Nash, Stanley Spencer, I mean, the Nevinson, the list goes on and on and on. And that is, for me as an art historian, what made the First World War such an appealing subject, because all of the great artists of the period were involved or implicated in the war in one way or another. Well, there's a lot of debate about the legacy, the artistic legacy of the First World War. The traditional view is that the war's artistic legacy was overwhelmingly negative, that it set back British art by five years, ten years, even more than that. But in this book, I actually uh, argue something very different and argue that, in, in fact, the artistic legacy of the First World War was overwhelmingly positive. It was productive, it was creative, and it was constructive. And that is because the First World War created an unusual set of conditions that enabled artists, 
art institutions, the government and the public to collaborate, to come together and work together. And that continued through the interwar period. And it's certainly the case that in the 1920s and 1930s, British art was more receptive to society and British society was more receptive to art. And that was because of the First World War. Art can have many roles in war. Um, one of them is uh, to support the war. So for, for, for much of history, we've seen artists being used to glorify, to endorse, to legitimize uh, war and the governments who are waging the war. But on the other hand, there's another tradition that runs all the way from Goya uh, all the way through to Picasso, that, that where artists were using their work to criticize and condemn the war as an act of resistance. And that happens in the First World War as well in other parts of Europe, particularly with the Dada movement. Um, but perhaps the most enduring role that art can perform during war is to immortalize it, to memorialize it. You look, for instance, at the great sculptures on the Parthenon, uh, and you can take it all the way through to the official war art that was made in the First World War. And what artists have done continuously through history for thousands of years is to take the sort of messy events of war and to turn them into images, objects, stories that have a kind of timeless quality. For me, the most powerful British artwork to come out of the First World War was a little painting I discussed it in the book by Paul Nash called We Are Making a New World. And it's unbelievably powerful. And I, and I, and I challenge anyone to look at that painting and not be moved by it in some way. It captures the aftermath of the Battle of Passchendaele. It's uh, awful sort of sunrise moment when you can see this churning ocean of mud, these dead trees that, are, that, that, that become like hands imploring the heavens. And the sunrise takes on this uh, appearance of uh, the sun streaming through uh, an ocean of red blood. Uh, and it's obviously called We Are Making a New World. It's deeply ironic. And it's tremendously powerful. So that, for me, is perhaps the, the image of the First World War that, for me, is the most memorable.